Good evening, this is Pastor Barbara. Today is May 25th, 2016. We are in the Old Testament. This is a Wednesday night live um, Bible study on iVlog.tv. Um, we are now in the second world power. If we want to start with Babylon being the first, there are actually a couple before that. But if we start with um, uh, what some of the prophets tell us the world powers are going to be, we have had the first one, which is Babylon. It ended, I believe, last Wednesday when Belshazzar went into the temple of their gods where they had taken the things they had stolen from God's temple in Jerusalem and put them in the same edifice, in the same building. And um, they were already tipsy and they got drunker and the hand appeared and wrote on the wall. It upset Belshazzar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's son, in about, I believe, his third year. He was looking for anybody who could tell him what it said. His mother reminded him that his father could always, I hear Kiki ringing her bell, um, his mother reminded him that Daniel was a man in whom the spirits of God were. And he told him that the writing on the wall, Mene Mene Tetelopharsin, means it's over. It's over for you, you die tonight. It's over for Babylon. And that's when the Medes and the Persians came into power. So tonight, we begin with Persia is the world power. Now, Medes, Media, was a little bit southwest of Persia, which is Iran. It was smaller. It was less powerful. But on Nebuchadnezzar's image, dream, it did have the picture of the two arms and the chest. It was made of silver, less precious um, than gold, but silver is a little stronger than gold. And that's where we begin tonight. Cyrus's name, although we haven't heard of him before, Cyrus's name has already appeared in the Bible. Cyrus's name is in the Bible. If God said, I'm going to put this man's name in the Bible, he wasn't even born yet. But this is the man that's going to liberate the Jews. We're in Isaiah, chapter 44. This is what uh, Cyrus the Mede, whoops. He said of Cyrus, forget about the Mede, Cyrus is a Persian. Cyrus, my shepherd, shall perform all my pleasure. This is God talking to the prophet, telling the people, I, God, have chosen Cyrus. He's going to do what I want him to do. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. And saying to the temple, your foundation will be laid. 
God is saying through his prophet, this is the man. He's going to see that the city gets built. He didn't destroy the city. Another kingdom, another king did. But he has now destroyed, or they have, the Medes and the Persians together, have destroyed Babylon, Babylonia, and they are the world leader. And God has chosen to use him. And actually, the Persians are going to foot the bill for the temple destroyed by the Babylonians to be rebuilt, and the city destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. One verse in Daniel 121. Daniel continued even to the year of the first year of King Cyrus. Just that one verse out of the first chapter of Daniel. What does it mean? It means that after Daniel plus Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three that were cast into the fiery furnace and didn't burn up, that they were still, even though Babylon was not the leading nation now, they were still admired by the world leaders, even though those world leaders were now somebody else. We, we go to chapter 11 and read one verse from Daniel 11. I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I, stood to confirm and to strengthen him. So Daniel continued to be admired by the world leader and um, he strengthens them or gives them advice and gives them help. Now we go to Daniel 9. And we read a little bit more. I'm reading in the King James Version. In the first year of Darius, he was a Mede. Uh, he was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Uh, near the area where, Pers where um, Babylon had been. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Daniel had no idea how long this thing was going to last. He was about a teenager when this 70 year period began, but he didn't know it would last for 70 years. He didn't know if it'd last for a year, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. He had no clue. But God had more than one prophet, six or seven that lived about the same time. A few lived a little bit later. But Jeremiah the prophet, God did give him the information as to how long the thing would last. Sometimes it's nice if a husband and wife, one of them knows a lot about one thing, and the other one doesn't know a thing about that, but knows a whole lot about something else. That's how it was with some of the prophets. God shared with Jeremiah that it was going to be a 70-year period. So Daniel starts counting. Okay, I was a teenager, and then Daniel's getting close to, got close to 80, and now he's about 85. And it's getting pretty close to the 70 years. So Daniel knew that time was about up. So now that period of time is up. I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereby the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. 
that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face to the Lord, and he began seeking the Lord with prayers and supplications and fasting, and he dressed in sackcloth and ashes. That's what they did to show that they were sad. If the nation was in trouble and they wanted to participate in showing their feelings of it, that's what they did. And I prayed unto the Lord, and I made my confession. Now, Daniel hadn't sinned. Daniel had been used of God to point out Nebuchadnezzar's sin, to point out Belshazzar's sin. So if Daniel didn't sin, why is Daniel confessing sin? I hear people doing that now that we're getting closer to the final elections. Um, they say, our nation is in trouble. Uh, we have more debt than we've ever had before. We are doing crazy things, such as allowing somebody who says, well, I think today I'm a girl. I'll go in the girls' restroom. In order to spare the feelings of one transgender or transsexual, we put hundreds, tens of hundreds, thousand hundreds, who knows how many people are uncomfortable with this one guy in the bathroom because if he were in another bathroom, he would be uncomfortable. That's crazy. But hey, it wouldn't hurt if we, the USA, did what Daniel did. Daniel confessed the sins of the nation. And I set my face to the Lord by prayer and supplication and fasting. And I prayed to the Lord and I made my confession, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, Keeping his commandments, we have sinned, we've committed iniquity. Daniel personally hadn't. But the nation had, and he was part of that nation. We've departed from the precepts and from the judgments, just like we have. We were built the U.S. of A., and I'm looking to see who's here. I, I think all of our people here are from the U.S.A. I'm not sure. I don't know about our guests. Um, nevertheless, this nation, although I'm just learning that in the beginning of our nation, sometimes certain states were built on certain religious denominations. But in general, the nation said, you are free to worship whatever God, who, whoever God you wish to, in whichever way you want to. We're not going to make you um, be a Baptist, be a Methodist, because they felt oppression as having to be members of the Church of England, when the Queen or the King of England was the head of the church, therefore, as head of the nation. So, but, but we've gone so far from that that we don't want anything that resembles any of the religious faiths we had at the beginning of our nation. We would rather have an atheist 
some in our government feel much more comfortable having an atheist around than having somebody from another denomination. So Daniel led the nation in confessing, not his own sins, but the sins of the nation. We haven't hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spoke in the name to our kings. They had one king after another king after another king after another king who didn't serve God. Therefore, they had one generation that didn't serve God and the next generation didn't serve God and the next generation, why should they? The kings didn't. Lord, righteousness belongs to you. Unto us, the confusion of faces. Lord, and in verse 8 now, chapter 9. To us belongs the confusion to face to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we sinned against thee. We as a nation. So I, as part of this nation, am confessing admitting that the things that we are doing are wrong. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord or walked in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. It isn't that we don't know the law. First of all, they had the law written down. But suppose nobody read it to them. Suppose nobody explained it to them. Suppose nobody preached to them. They still had God's servants, prophets, and others. Yet all Israel has transgressed God's law. They didn't obey his voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. So the whole nation, says Daniel, is under a curse. That's why God allowed Nebuchadnezzar. Not that Nebuchadnezzar did a good thing. Not that Nebuchadnezzar got away with what he did. Because he didn't. So Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon would be punished for what they did to Israel. But Israel, God allowed them to punish Israel because he said, I won't, but I'll allow your enemies to do it when you don't obey me. So Israel didn't obey God. So God allowed their enemies, who happened to be world leaders at the time, to take them over and keep them in captivity for 70 years. Now he says, the curse is poured out upon us and the oath was written in the law of Moses because we've sinned against him. They sinned against God and that was the way that God punished them was to allow their enemies to do so. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges by bringing upon us a great evil. He allowed this evil thing to happen to us. It was our fault, or the fault of our parents, our grandparents, our forefathers. It's written in the Law of Moses. This evil is come upon us. Yet we made not our prayer before the Lord, and we didn't turn from our iniquities, and we didn't understand the truth. We sinned. We didn't go to God in prayer and tell him we were sorry we sinned. Therefore, this evil has come upon us. Now he talks about the coming out of, of Egypt many years before that when God used Moses to bring the Jews out of Egypt. And now, O oh Lord, you brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, opened up a part of the Nile River, the Red Sea, 
with a mighty hand, and you got us and you renowned. People would see a Jew and say, oh, you're one of them that God brought out of Israel. Oh, you're one of the ones that the sea opened up for. Oh, we don't want to mess with the Jews because their God is the God that brought them out of Egypt. So because of Moses bringing them out of Egypt, Moses got famous, God got famous, the Jews were connected in the minds of people with a great miracle. According to your righteousness, I beseech you, I beg you, let your anger and your fury be turned away from Jerusalem. The fact, God, that you're mad at us. Don't take it out on Jerusalem. Because of our sins and our iniquities. Now, therefore, God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplication. Daniel is praying. God, hear my prayer on your servant. Cause your face to shine upon thy sanctuary, which is desolate. The sanctuary is the temple. It's destroyed. It's in ruins. It's desolate. He says, cause your face to shine upon that broken down, destroyed temple for the Lord's sake. Incline your ear, verse 18, and the city that is called by thy name, the city of God. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our own unrighteousness. He said, God, I'm not coming because I'm that good. That's not why I'm praying. But because you're merciful, God, that's why I'm praying. Lord, forgive. Hearken. For your own sake, God's got a, repu a, a reputation also. For your sake and for the people that are called by your name, God's people. Now, that's chapter 9. We're going to continue in chapter 9. And now we get the vision of the 70 weeks of years. It, it comes out to 490 years. To bring us up to date, and let me get a little uh, ANW logo. I got thirsty driving up this mountain. I've told you this before. We haven't got to it yet. I probably will mention it again and eventually we'll get to it, maybe even tonight, where Cyrus will sign a decree. Cyrus is now king of Persia. The Medes and the Persians are now the world power. God has decided He's going to use Cyrus, and Cyrus has decided he's going to foot the bill to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city and make right everything that Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon made wrong. Um, but we have a break in here. And Daniel 9, explaining about 70 weeks of years. Weeks refers to sevens. So seven weeks is seven sevens. And we get 490 years. Just remind you of some prophecies we've already studied. In the past. It was prophesied that after 
483 years, Messiah would be presented to the people of Israel. And when Jesus got on a donkey, or the foal of a donkey, and rode through that eastern gate, the one that is now sealed up and has a Muslim cemetery on the outside of the gate, which is sealed up. Jesus, Messiah, was presented as king of the Jews. And when the Jewish leaders said, don't let those children worship you, Jesus said they have to. They had to recognize that he was their king and their Messiah. And he did it on a certain day and prophecy which again was fulfilled it said and after that messiah will be cut off that happened on sunday on the friday after messiah was cut off that means dead so that much was fulfilled we're talking here about 490 years and 483 went by and then all of a sudden they stopped counting I'm sure some counted another seven years and nothing happened and nobody could figure it out. So I imagine everybody said, well, there goes something we don't understand in the Bible. I wonder what it means. And I'm sure a lot of people came up with ideas of what it meant. Probably some of them said, oh, God told me it means this and it means the other. But actually, we lost count at the end of 483 years. So we got seven years to go. Well, we'll get to it very soon in the book of Revelation on Sunday night when we study the seven years of tribulation. Those are the seven years. This seven-year period was to begin when Cyrus signs, not when he writes it, not when he talks about it, but when he signs his name and puts his kingly seal on it. The 490 years begins to count. Remember, there's 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the birth of Christ. And so we're talking 490 years. That's where we are now. Uh, I mean, Daniel 9, verse 20. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication to the Lord for my God and the holy mountain of my God, while I was doing that, a man, Gabriel, who I had seen in my vision at the beginning. Remember, he saw animals with horns and strange things. He said, I saw him at the beginning. He caused to fly swiftly and he touched me at the time of the evening oblation. It was evening worship. Oh, Daniel's not in his temple, but hey, that doesn't keep it. A believer from worshiping does it he informed me and he talked to me and he said Daniel I'm gonna come forth and give you skill and understanding Daniel says God through uh, the angel Gabriel I'm gonna teach you something Verse 23, at the beginning of my supplications, the commandment came forth. And I'm come to show you, you are greatly beloved. 
So understand the matter and consider the vision. God says, Daniel, I love you. Now think about that vision. Think about this. Seventy weeks. Yes, seventy times weeks are seven. So seventy times seven are determined upon the people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression to make right the wrong. Going to be 470 years. Well, remember 400 and 490. I'm sorry, 490. 483 have gone by. And then we stopped counting. To make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, in other words, to make all the wrong things right, to bring in an everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So I'm going to teach you some things. And it's going to bring us up to date on this matter of sin. Verse 25. Know therefore and understanding. Okay, Daniel, get your thinking cap on. Pay attention, Daniel. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah and the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Three score is 20, 40, 60. So three score and two is 62. And the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Okay, Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. The street will be rebuilt. The walls will be rebuilt. But it's going to be during troublous times. The riots are going to go on when you're trying to build a street. You're going to try to erect the wall. There are going to be people out there fighting, like we saw on television last night. And after three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off. I mentioned that just a few moments ago. Messiah will be cut off. There's a double prophecy here. There's a prophecy about, and, and, and we find this in, in this general area of scripture. We find it this way. We find Israel being restored because the Babylonians destroyed it. But at the same time, we're talking about Israel will be restored and Jesus will return to rule. So we have these two things. One is going to happen right away and it's talking about Jerusalem fixing it up after what Nebuchadnezzar and Babylonia did to it. But it's also talking about Jesus returning to fix it up after we get the last seven years and things are in such a horrible mess, worse as we're learning in the book of, of, Gener of uh, Revelation, worse than anything the 
last seven plagues that we're into now are unbelievable. The suffering, the things that are going to happen. And the people continue to hate God, to think against him. To refuse to honor him, knowing that these things could stop if they would stop. So we have uh, uh, some of these prophecies being fulfilled twice. First, you realize that when I was born, there was no Israel. I was a sophomore in Bible college when Israel became a nation. Some of this stuff could not have been fulfilled on the day of my birth. The Jews could not have come from around the world and gone to Israel because there wasn't any Israel. As a matter of fact, Jews weren't allowed in Palestine. Okay, let me go back now, verse 25, 26. And after three score, 24 to 60, and two weeks, 62 weeks times seven, shall Messiah be cut off, not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. We're back now talking about the destruction of the temple. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. That would be pretty hard for my grandfather to have preached if he'd been a preacher. Because some of it's talking about something in the very near future, and the, the more we get into what some of these prophets said, the more we understand how absolutely close we are. As a matter of fact, soon we'll be coming upon a verse in Isaiah, in um, uh, Ezekiel, that I preached uh, my congregation, and I drove, th I drove through that town. I, I took a wrong turn. I haven't been in that town that I pastored three years in for so long that I was running out of gas. And uh, I didn't dare. Uh, I knew that I, if I didn't make it to the bottom of the mountain, there were no gas stations uh, until I got down to San Bernardino, and I didn't want to take a chance. So I went through a city where I used to pastor, and I haven't been there in years. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's seven years. He will confirm his covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, boy, we're jumping around, but I've been telling you this stuff and repeating it and repeating it. It's just that right now, tonight, we're in the year 539 years before the birth of Christ. 539 years before the birth of Christ. There's going to be a week left, he says, after Messiah is cut off. There's going to be seven years left. And in the midst of the week, in the middle, what's the middle of seven years? Seven years divided by two equals three and a half years. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, seven years. And in the middle of the week, after three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation, worship, etc., to cease. In that seven-year tribulation period that hasn't started yet. 
It won't start while there's a saint on earth until after the rapture or the resurrection of the saints, the dead first and then those that are alive. After that happens, then we can start the clock again or the calendar and we'll have seven years. Now, when half of that seven years is up, when three and a half years have gone by, now if we want to jump over quickly to where we're studying on Sunday nights in Revelation, um, we are already with that last, we've had three seven year, um, not seven years, we've had three uh, groups of plagues and we're in the last one, we're, we're, the worse they are, the closer we are to the end of the seven years, because at the end of seven years is, is suffering and pain and destruction like nobody has ever even imagined. But halfway through, after three and a half years, see how we're getting this double? Okay, so Persia is now the world leader. And... Cyrus is getting ready to have the Jews go back to Jerusalem. But Daniel is a prophet and Gabriel is an angel is talking to him. And now Gabriel's telling him something that has nothing to do with that period of history. He's over here talking about another period of history. I don't easily criticize people who preach prophecy and may teach it a tiny bit different than the way I do because it's not easy picking out when it jumps from here to there in one verse it's not easy to say exactly where does this fit you have to know everything all of the prophets say and you have to know what Revelation says and then have a lot of gifts and grace of God to figure it out. And if somebody doesn't get every year, every little thing perfect, I'm certainly not going to criticize them. Now, when they start making the Bible say something it didn't say, if they get something in the wrong place, I'm not everybody is as blessed to have as much education as somebody else. Not everybody is blessed to have a general knowledge of prophecy. Not every, uh, I, I'm not going to criticize everybody that tries to teach the Word of God and maybe doesn't get it the same way I get it. And I would hope that if I'm ever found in a little bit of error, I guarantee it's not going to be a big error, <laughs> I would hope that others would be gentle with me. Because if you have that attitude, God will lead you into truth. When you start thinking you know it all, watch it. He will cause the sacrifice and the worship to cease. That means there's going to be a temple built. And I believe that that's going to be the deal that the Antichrist will make with Israel. So that's going to mean that within three and a half years, they've already got a temple built. And they've already got worship going on because he's going to stop the worship and this morning and evening sacrifice. Here it just says the sacrifice to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So we're going to leave that for a moment. We're going to go to Psalm 102, which is written at about this same time. I'm going to read a couple of Psalms that were written about this time, not all of them but some verses that you will recognize. And then I'm going to go to 
Ezra. Ezra was a man of God. Ezra was a Bible teacher. When nobody's gone to church for 70 years, you better have a Bible teacher around to tell you. You know what the Bible says? You know what God expects from you? Um, before I do that, I'm going to close this video and we'll go to uh, our second video. But this is the first one for tonight. It's 45 minutes and 22 seconds. So until the next video, blessings on you.